uh, Song of Moses. If you look in Deuteronomy 31, 30, Moses, then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And so he's, he's given this song of Moses. It's, it's like a psalm. I'm sure they would have had musical instruments. <clears throat> you know, every week we, I, I seem to have a new evidence for musical instruments, Rick. Yep. And uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is even more important than the instrument. And the joy in our heart. You know, our faith should give us joy in our heart. And the music is an expression of the joy in our heart. Mm -hmm. And so we better sing. And I, I discovered that people who don't like instruments sometimes don't like singing at all. And you look at their, you know, in the assembly, the expression on their face. Do they, do they sing the words? Uh, when you, you know, song services really are not an Old Testament, New Testament. If we want to know how to be, have a choir, we actually got to go to the Old Testament. The New Testament is meeting in the underground. Now, what kind of a song service are you going to have when you're meeting in catacombs and in the underground? Hey, let's take it to the roof. You know, we can all get arrested. The Roman guard will hear us. So, really, you got to go to oh, the Old Testament. And we talked about the rock last week, Rick. Mm -hmm. But let, this week, I want to... Uh, look at some verses here. I want to look. Uh, there's some deprecatory things that David would pray. David, we don't think of Moses as a psalmist, but there's a lot of similarities I noticed in our preparation between uh, some of the things David would write and Moses would write. Now, in, in Deuteronomy, I have some things, Rick, and I know you uh -huh. have some things uh, prepared. The rock is the foundation. You know, our foundation is our feet. One of our sisters wrote that uh, her shoes went bad and she wanted to get a new pair of shoes and she said our foundation is so important. And I thought of the Ephesian warrior in Ephesians chapter 6 that says, uh, you know, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Shod is an old King James word, Rick, but you know, it's where we get our word shoes. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have the right equipment. And, We've got to have the right foundation. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, it says, Remember the days of old. You know, that's a great... When we're going through trials and tribulations, you know, remember the days of old. Remember the God of old. You know, in Daniel 7, it calls God the Ancient of Days. It's one of his titles, Ancient of Days. Remember the old things. Remember beginnings. Mm -hmm. You know, how many beginnings? I was coming out of Walmart, and there was a, a, a family, and I was just walking through the door. I, you know, they have exit over here and entrance over here, and I don't know really which one you go out and you go in. But there was a mom, and she called her little girl and says, Come here, Genesis. And I was like, <laughs> Did I understand you, ma'am, correctly? Is her name Genesis? She said, Yes. I said, The first book of the Bible? And she got a big smile on her face. She said, Yes. Can you imagine a girl's wow. name? You mm -hmm. know, we have girls' names named for Bible, like uh, uh, Charity. I've heard the girl's word, Charity. Faith. Grace. Faith Gracie. Grace. Mm -hmm. Grace. Isn't that great when you name, get your names from the Bible? They make good names, oh, the, don't they? The fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> yeah, the fruits of the Spirit. And uh, the, Russians are, the Russians do that probably more than anybody. They've got uh, Luba is the word. Uh, the three things in Corinthians, they got faith, hope, and love. And all three of those are Russian girls' names. Vera is faith, Luba is love, and Nadezhda is hope. Faith, hope, and love. Wow. And, uh, of course, Anastasia <laughs> is the re word resurrection. Anastasia. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they just go on and on. You can, you can uh, many of the names come from Bible uh, teachings. But remember the days of old and consider the years of many generations. You know, consider the generations, Rick. Mm -hmm. Generations are in the Bible. You know, Jesus said, unto what shall I like in this generation? <clears throat> and I just go nuts. You know, we listen to these sociologists talking about, well, this is Generation X. And, you know, this is the, before that was the me generation. They were really selfish. And, and now we got snowflakes. <laughs> now, that, that, millennials, yeah. Mill millennials, yeah. yeah. They, snowflakes isn't from the sociologists. That's from somebody else. Uh, millennials. Uh -huh. that, that, that's some observation. Yeah, what shall we like in this generation? 
Mm -hmm. So it's a hard, it's a <clears throat> hard mission field, isn't it, to try yeah. to yeah, tap into the generations? Yeah, consider the years of all generations, and and yeah, it's it's clearly you know it, when 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 a society is based on God's word, yeah, then then. Each, each generation, you can go back to the advice of, of those that have already lived a life, right. you know, and, and you know, when they've lived it and seen how successful and profitable and fruitful it is in this world yeah. to live by God's word, you know, then, then you can go back and ask these people who have done it God's way right. and, and get that advice and have your own profitable, fruitful yes. life. Now, Rick, bear with me now. We know, uh, I have some thoughts here. I want you to really... All right. I want to jump in ahead? No, 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 no. I want you to think with me. Okay. We know the chronology of Moses' life. In Acts 7, Stephen uh, has a great Old Testament discourse. <laughs> I can't believe that Roman uh, Catholic woman tried to say that Stephen made a mistake. You know, he's preaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. There's a chronological uh, question there, and it can be resolved with the dating and she says, Stephen made a mistake. I said, you mean in Acts 7 when he's preaching to the Sanhedrin? Mm -hmm. he made, yeah, he made a mistake in his Jewish history. He's talking to the Supreme Court of Judaism. Uh -huh. If he makes a mistake, don't you think they're going to call him on it? Yep. The, most, the highest, the most you know, noteworthy men, Stephen made a mistake. My eye, you got a low view of the Holy Spirit. inspiration of the, of, the, yeah. of the Holy Spirit who inspired this book. you got a low view of the authority of the Word of God. Well, in Acts 7, there are three sets of 40. 40 years, Moses grew up in mm -hmm. the palace of Egypt. 40 years, he went into the wilderness, tending sheep, mm -hmm. pre preparation for ministry. The last 40 years, from 80 to 120, he leads God's people out, yep. the Exodus. Uh -huh. Now, what happens now in Deuteronomy? I don't know how mo old Moses is in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, but let's say, let's say we're, in the, we're in the last 30 of Moses' 40 years. Let's say 20 years went by, and now we got a generation growing up. We'd call them teenagers. Maybe they're young adults now. They leave the teenage realm. They're 20 years old, and they grew up, and they were not there. They were not eyewitnesses to the crossing of the Red Sea. They were not there as the eyewitnesses of the destruction of Pharaoh's army. All right, and now you've got your first generation of the Church of Christ, Old Testament Church of Christ, that weren't there to see the glory of God, the power of God. And they're growing up, and they're looking around the wilderness. And they need some guidance. Now, if they were over here at the local university and they need guidance, and where does Moses tell them to get it? And who else? Verse 7. Your father. Ask who? Your father. Where's your father? Where's your father? And then the elders. Now, if they were over at the local university, Alex, what would they say? Forget everything your parents ever told you. Yeah, your parents are ignoramuses. Don't listen to them. They don't know anything. What else did he say? That pretty much took care of it. You don't want to give his name out. I don't. You know why shouldn't we? I mean, if he believes that, he's te how many kids are in that classroom? Three hundred. Three hundred kids sitting in a room with auditorium with three hundred people listening to a guy go on and on talking about marriage, relationships. That your mom and dad don't know anything about marriage and love. He's been divorced how many times? Four times, telling us that, we, that telling the kids that their moms and dads, probably some of whom are still happily married, that they don't know anything about marriage. And he's been <laughs> divorced four times. Yep. What we need to do, and, and there's an well, organization. Well, well, don't, don't people say you, you learn from your failures, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got to be an he expert. Just learned, all he learned how to do is fail more. Yeah, well, we're living in a day where parental authority is under attack. Parents are not welcome. When you pull into the, into the government school parking lot, they have a sign, tobacco free zone. They might as well say Jesus free zone, parent free zone, wisdom free zone. Constitution free zone. Constitution free zone. Hey, did you kids watch the inauguration? No. Well, you watched it eight years ago. You didn't watch it this time, huh? I don't care about the candidate, but what about all the godly prayers and all the God and country? And, you know, who says religion and government, you know, don't mix? Well, all these prayers are being offered up. Mm -hmm. Even patriotism. I, I went to the garbage dump yesterday, and somebody was throwing away some good old books. 
They're in my car, actually. There and there was an American history book from 100 years ago, maybe 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it had black and white, but there was one little section in the middle they did in color. And it had all the flags. And they had the revolutionary naval flags. And there was a, pine, it was a white flag with a green pine tree on it. And do you know what it said on the top? An appeal to heaven. Can you imagine wow. going through the flags of American history? Yeah, we, we're not a Christian nation. Uh, what's this flag? An appeal to heaven. Mm -hmm. So what are we saying here? You know, if you want to have wisdom, who do you consult in, in Deuteronomy 32, 7? Consult your father. Anybody? Anybody route up out there? If you want wisdom, ask your father. Now, Solomon could have said that. David could have said that. But this is Moses saying it. He didn't have a father. <coughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a consoling thought. Maybe we don't have fathers. He didn't know him. He didn't, did he? Daniel didn't have a father. Many great men in the Old Testament didn't have fathers. But somebody taught them about their heavenly father. father. They had a godfather. Mm -hmm. Rick, what, what do you think about this? We're in Deuteronomy 32, 7. Moses said, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you. Ask your father. That's a great Father's Day sermon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a physical father, ask your spiritual father, because we have spiritual paternity. Keep going. I can hear. I can hear you. You're good. All right. Um, <clears throat> and he will show but, you your elders, and they will tell mm -hmm. you where's the elders at. <clears throat> now we're not talking about an elder in Ephesians four eldership, but what about elders? What about our wise old men? The glory mm -hmm. of the of the hair, mm -hmm. the glory of the crown is the gray hair, if it be obtained in the way of the Lord. I mean, there's other ways to obtain it, <laughs> but if you obtain your gray hair in the way of the Lord. Who's going to help but, me? But, Who's going to help me out there? But, but they, they have that I wisdom. need some commentary. Yeah, uh, and, and, that's, and, that's, and that's why, that's, that's why the uh, uh, elders are put forth in, in the Bible, in Timothy and in Titus, saying that they need to be older, older men, that they need to meet that definition because they have this experience that, that Moses is talking about here. He, uh, you know, your elders have that that uh, that knowledge, that wisdom, those those years of growing up in and doing things God's way. They've they've raised family, they've raised kids, and you know these are, these are defining terms. You know that to have raised their kids in in uh, in, the, in God, in, in Jesus, and uh, you know you have to have that foundation in your society yes. based on God. Yes, you know so that multiple generations come from. Um, the, the, the perspective of God, you know, when it says, you know, raise your children in, 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 in the way that they should follow, they'll continue throughout their life. And because you need that foundation, you need it to go from generation to generation. I've seen, uh, we've, at the local university, the football team, I've seen some, uh, some successful athletes, and they didn't necessarily, they came, some of them came from broken homes, mm -hmm. and some of them are reporting on the social media that They've drawn near to the Lord, and they have, they have uh, covenanted in their heart that they're going to be a father to their children that they didn't have. So it can happen. And, but they know the secret is that it's a, spiritual, uh, it's a spiritual bond. It's a spiritual allegiance. And so I know that it can happen. All right, let's go on. I thought maybe we'd get some takers, but let's keep going here. We're in Deuteron Deuteronomy 32. This is very important because uh, we don't teach our young people about Proverbs anymore. We're teaching them the plan of salvation. We, we're trying to teach them about New Testament, but we don't know a lot of the Proverbs. So we've got these uh, young generation that uh, take, sometimes they take unbiblical positions. And they're, and they're like children tossed to and fro in the wind, like Ephesians chapter 2. A lot, we have to be careful that, we have to be careful. There's a lot of 
denominations today that are looking for utopianism. They're trying to create an earthly utopia. And we fall into a trap because we know that in the Bible there are things that, we, that Christ gave to the church. Mm -hmm. We don't run the church. Christ is not running the church the same way he's running the world. There are things that Christ gave the church in the Sermon on the Mount. That, but then there's other things that God gave the world at large. And a lot of these things go back to the Tower of Babel. God created nations. And I think this is a, a great verse here in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. He says, go back and ask your, your elders, your fathers, and they will tell you when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam. He set the boundaries of the peoples. So are we going to have open borders? You know, you can take biblical wisdom and you can apply them. The God created nations. The, in Acts 17, he determined beforehand their times of their appointed times and the boundary lines of their habitation. Mm -hmm. So we've got nations, you've got borders. And God set those boundaries. They're not to be tampered with. The sovereignty of nations. Why? God doesn't want another Tower of Babel. He doesn't want another Nimrod. God doesn't want a united nations. Because they can be corrupted and, and, and turn the whole fabric of the world upside down and send millions of peoples to hell. And that's why God likes nations, because they're checks and balances. According to the number of the children of Israel, do you know there were 70 grandsons of Noah, 67 plus 3? And do you know we had 70, you have 70 sons of Noah, and then you have 70 families of Jacob that went down into Egypt. The number 70, mm -hmm. typologically, uh, was correspondent. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. So after the, when God allotted the nations at the Tower of Babel, God also allotted the, the nations of Canaan, mm -hmm. when the 12 tribes went into Canaan. <clears throat> there were 70 families that went into Egypt of the 12 sons. They had 70 grandsons. You can count them up, even the children of Benjamin. And they counted them, 70 and 70. And God allotted the, their inheritance across the world and across Canaan. And God is a good God. Let's go to Acts 14, and I want to show you we have two sermons by Paul, Acts 17, but in Acts 14. Why did God determine all these things? Well, he wanted a witness. In Acts 14, verse 15, Paul and Barnabas rebuked the crowd. They wanted to worship them because of the miracle that they performed. And in Acts 14, verse 15, mm -hmm. they said, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Mm -hmm. So God even blessed the pagan nations, didn't he? he? He blessed them, whether they admitted it or not, and whether they walked in his ways or not. God was good to his creation. All right, any comments? All right, let's go to the eagle in verse 17, 32, uh, sorry, in verse 11. Uh, you know, the children of Israel, God found them in the desert. And as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. God carried his people, the Israelites. I like what God said in Deuteronomy 7. I didn't choose you because you were many. Go back and look at this, Deuteronomy 6 and 7. God picked them up like an eagle, uh, picking up its young and carrying them. Uh, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, 
You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Now look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the house of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, verse 9, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for how many generations, Rick? For a thousand generations. A thousand generations. Wouldn't that be something if we could have a great uh, divine genealogist? who could trace every mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. from creation down to the present? Wouldn't that be something? How many generations would it be in 6,000 years? What's 6,000 divided by 20? 300? 300. 300. We've had 300 generations if we let a generation every 20 years and we count the earth as being 6,000 years. 300 generations. Well, 1,000 generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. So God is good, Rick. Mm -hmm. God is good. But, you know, he's not to be rejected, is he? No. All right. What do you got, Rick? I know that... We have a few minutes here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do the de deprecatory, uh, the David, uh, where God said he's gonna, what he's going to do to the enemies? In verse 23. You go back to 22. This is one of our verses in mm -hmm. Sheol. God, you know, God's an angry God. It's a mistake to have God all loving and not have wrath. All right, what do you got right. in your notes? I know you got... Because at some point, because we, we have the, the teaching side where God's reminding them of all the, all the good and, and the blessings that he'll have. But then we also have the part where there's the, the prophetic part, where it's God's actually speaking prophetically. We, we think it's, it's um, uh, that he's rebuking them for things they haven't done, but this is God. And, and it's more you know, God speaking prophetically where this is going to happen, and these are the things that are going to happen to you because of it. Yes. You know, that, that this song, which is going to be written in their hearts and minds, that they're going to memorize, like, like you know, like, like when, when we get somewhere and we get a song stuck in our head and we can't get it to quit. But I know that there's songs from when I was young that come up and I still hear them. I still hear them playing in my head. I still hear the lyrics. I still, and it gets stuck in your head. Well, that's what God's doing. He's creating this song of Moses for each generation to teach it to the next to teach it in the, in the tabernacle, to teach it from the elders and the, the, the adults teaching it to the kids. So it constantly reminds them. And, and so that's one of the things that we're going through here is the blessings. And now, but they're also, God has to say, you know, this is what you're capable of. You're capable of, of turning against me. And, and as we've seen before, this is what turning against me, my wrath will bring you. Um, it's, I think it's a very powerful tool for, for uh, bearing witness. Uh, of God to, to the people of Israel. Verse 23, I will heap disasters on them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence, bitter destruction. I will send against them the teeth of the beasts, mm -hmm. the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within. You know, I'll, be, I'll tell you that uh, some of my Bible studies... Uh, I start out with uh, my soul winning with somebody who has no knowledge of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll begin with the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. You think that's a good place to start? The wrath of God? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wrath of God is revealed. And in Ephesians 2, you know, it's, uh, it talks about we were children of wrath. You know, whether we knew it or not, isn't that a frightening thing to be a child of wrath and not even know it and to be against God? So the wrath of God is a great place to start. And then, then we can talk about propitiation. Mm -hmm. 
I had a Bible study. I had a man come in my yard, and he was a, a very professional and intelligent man. He had a lot of degrees, Rick. Mm -hmm. I said, have you ever heard of the word propitiation? Uh -huh. He said, no, I haven't. I said, does it sound interesting to you? He said, it sure does. I says, can I just take a few minutes and expound on you uh, the theology of propitiation? He said, sure. And I talked about, you know, how that we need a covering that God, uh, you know, the, the wrath of God has to be appeased. And, and we had a nice conversation. And I, I used my dad's illustration about, you know, when your wife's angry with you and you have a bouquet of flowers behind your back. And I use that as a little... Uh, visual aid and illustration and so we talked about you know the wrath of God being appeased by the cross and he said I want to thank you and I and I, he said thank you for that Bible study I said did you like it and he said yeah and he said also the part about you know how to handle your angry wife so <laughs> you know that was the end of the cut we laughed but mm -hmm. you know there's an angry wife is, you know, a real problem. But can you imagine? A, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry or the living God. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? What else about the Song of Moses? Is there anything here? We're, we got one last chapter. Uh, two last chapters, I'm sorry. He's going to go down and give a blessing to all the 12 tribes of Israel, Rick, mm -hmm. in 33. What's going on in Moses' mind as we conclude? Is, you know, when we get older, there's... What is it about when we get older, you know, we, we're not as warlike. We're not as... Uh, we have a, a peace that comes in. And, and I'm not saying that's bad. I think it's a good thing. We want to have peace, you know, in our heart toward men. What's going on, uh, Preacher D, in Moses' mind here? He's, he kind of knows the end of Israel. It's a little bit bittersweet. What is Moses doing here in this song, his farewell to Israel? Well, it's like, uh, you know, it'd be like a preacher resigning uh, from his ministry. He sees that everything he's done has uh, fallen into disrepute. Uh, and the, the congregation is not at all what it should be. And uh, he gets a farewell. And uh, the message isn't really good. He just, he said, I'm going to go to my reward. But he said, things are going to get worse for you. And they did. They got a whole lot worse. Because they refuse to listen to the gospel and respond to the word. And uh, kind of just leave it on the way. And that's uh, what Moses did in his farewell, in his farewell uh, sermon. He, he knew that the people were never going to follow what they were taught. So uh, apostasy is so easy in, its, in every generation. And it starts with Adam and Eve, they apostatized. Cain and Abel, they apostatized. The days of Noah, they apostatized. Uh, the Babylonian captivity, God's children apostatized. The Assyrian uh, captivity, Israel apostatized. Uh, then you come into the in-between the Testament. Judas Maccabee stood up and saw apostasy. Then John the Baptist comes and said, Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? People just don't remain faithful for very long. Very rare to see it, a faithful person for very long. Well, I mean, I don't mean to be more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's easy to walk with the Lord. Yes. But it's like Carson Wentz said the other day. He said, they said, you have a girlfriend? He said, I have a lover. And they said, well, who's that? He said, Jesus. He said, I'm not ashamed to tell you I love Jesus. That's kind of rare to hear a man who's so popular. And that's a little bit like what Tim Tebow did the same thing. Uh, they were very popular, but they loved Jesus. Most people love popularity. 
they love wealth, they mm -hmm. love riches, but they don't love people. You know, if we can get involved in the work, if we can, there's a lot of things doing, making calls. If we can get involved in the, in the daily affairs of the church, I think just our involvement will help us and keep us, you know, uh, keep our spirits in order and subjection. If we can get involved in the, in the, daily, the daily business of Jesus. Well, we have to pray for other people. And like you say, your input and your output. Your output has to be commensurable to your input. So if all you do is get input, 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 but no output, then you get stagnant. Uh, we have to share our faith. It has to grow outside of us. We got to get in trouble for our faith once in a while. Yeah. Well, I found out yesterday. I, we were. I thought we were going to get in trouble for sharing our faith, but the guy was so interested, and uh, he was so curious, and it ended up into a dinner invitation. So it about <laughs> blew my mind because I, I couldn't believe how receptive the guy was mm -hmm. to. Uh, even though he was religious, but it was something new, and he actually is going to meet us for dinner. So sometimes, you know, sometimes we get surprised when we shouldn't be, because the fields still are white under harvest. So we need labors. That people in the world are more zealous that you should share the gospel with them. Yeah. Than we are. Yeah. Share it. Uh, you never know. There's that one person out there that's really diverting. Yeah. And they have a self-identification uh, problem. And they also have a perverted and distorted value system. Yeah, there's two people I promised. They're, they're not happy in their value system yeah. at all. Although they act like it because they got nice clothes, lots of nice, nice cars. But yes. They're, they're miserable people that yeah. need spiritual help. That's right. Well, there's two people I got to get back with because I promised them, and uh, I just been having a hard time getting a hold of them. So I got two people myself that I got to go call on. And uh, Chuck actually helped me. Chuck went up to the hospital because he was our teacher at college, and uh, so I promised him. I said, "Can I teach you some things about the Bible?" And he said, "Yes." And so I got to find him. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we love you and. Lord, uh, we just read these bittersweet uh, words of Moses, and Lord, we're living it out, God, because it's almost as if it's Jesus. It, we're, regardless of the covenant, Lord, uh, they were on the other side, we're on this side, but they had Moses, we've got Christ. And Lord, uh, both of them were the prophets and the holy prophets, and one was the Messiah. One pointed to the Messiah, and the other was the Messiah. And, Lord, uh, I just pray that we'll take an inventory of our spirits. Lord, uh, we just have love in our hearts. God, I pray that we'll give that love an opportunity to be uh, demonstrated. So, Lord, uh, God, we just ask your blessing. Ask your blessing, God, on the congregation, on our beloved brothers and sisters, and, Lord, on the world, and help us to, to uh, prove our love that you have put in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, John, real quick. I want to share this with everybody. It's pretty amazing. I don't know who that is. This is so weird. Y'all go. guys may know this. And, and try this. See, see if it's changed from yesterday. But I saw this post. Did, did you see it? All right. On my search engine, I have Google. And you know, you can ask Google whatever, and it will verbally give you an answer. So I asked Google who Allah was. And it talked about the Islamic God, creator, blah, blah, blah. Asking about Hinduism, gave me an answer. Uh, Buddhism, it gives me an answer. So I asked him who Jesus Christ was, it goes silent. <laughs> will not tell you who Jesus Christ is. So to me, it's just another truth that we're fighting this raging, raging war for people's souls. And the Prince of the Power of Air, we can't beat him on our own. We can't defeat him. We have Jesus, our mediator. He's the one that paid the price for all of us. So guys, just uh, this cell phone, you know, we use it as a tool. I think it's a very dangerous tool. It can get out of hand. And Satan will overcome us with that, with that cell phone. We'll be doing things we shouldn't be doing on that cell phone. That's what I'm thinking. 
than we do. Because we're silent. They're vocal. And by their denial of Christ and their acceptance of all other gods, they are actually proving a point. Absolutely. Now, if, if, if Buddha was left out of the equation, I'd say I'm going to be a Buddhist. Because the world don't like it. But the world loves Buddha. The world loves the Nirvana. You know, the world loves all of these gods. Uh, pick your, take your choice. We're white people. <coughs> But when they exclude Christ, like you said, even on the, even on the cell phone, that tells us he has to be the one true God. Amen. It tells us, it, thank you, Randy, that was great. Well, it tells us that Christ is different than all the rest. He's different than all the rest, and he's in a different category than all the rest. Well, we know that. And they have to be silent. They, can't, they can talk about everybody else, but they can't talk about Jesus. Wow. Because he's the unspoken Lord. And uh, so if men are unspoken about Jesus, then that elevates him above the plane of all other gods. Well, we know that he is. He's the, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's take a...